Today, we will discuss about the structure of consciousness. This idea of a structure of consciousness is discussed by Searle in his uh, book, The Rediscovery of uh, the Mind, published in 1992 by MIT Press. Searle talks about uh, consciousness as something being caused by the brain processes and we have already discussed about it. According to Searle, consciousness is caused by brain processes and realized in brain processes. Referring to this Searle's thesis that consciousness is something biological and it is produced by the neurophysiological function of the brain processes. Now, so, far as this hypothesis is concerned, Searle tries to give a scientific uh, account of consciousness, a naturalistic account of consciousness. We have already discussed about this hypothesis, we have also discussed about the nature of intentionality as such. Today, we are going to discuss the structure of consciousness or the structure of intentional state. What is and what are the properties that constitute the intentional state? According to Searle, intentional state is constituted of various properties such as intentionality, subjectivity, aspectuality, unity. All these are properties or features of consciousness. Whenever we talk about consciousness, we talk about a composite feature of uh, our experience. So, in this context, what Searle is going to discuss about consciousness? That is what we would try to look at. And since Searle has been talking about this, that he belongs to the Wittgensteinian tradition, the tradition which was built by Frege and Wittgenstein. And then we look at uh, Wittgenstein's one of the famous uh, statements that consciousness is life itself that is Wittgenstein, where Wittgenstein tries to associate consciousness with life. Life is such a vast concept. Look at how Searle defines the notion of consciousness. According to Searle, he writes, I quote, consciousness is the central fact of specifically human existence, because all our other aspects of our existence such as language, love, humor and so on would be impossible without consciousness. So, consciousness has been associated with life and life is manifested in various forms. The very fact that human beings use language, the very fact that human beings fall in love with others, human beings have various aesthetic form of life and human beings are using language in a such a complex way is something very significant and it is through language or what Searle calls with the help of the principle of expressibility human beings expresses themselves. So, that is uh, something very significant about Searle. Searle does not suggest that his naturalistic hypothesis is a eliminative one. So, Searle's naturalism is rooted in biology and biology for Searle is a science that talks about human life or life per se. So, in this context it is very important to talk about consciousness and relate consciousness with life. So, when we relate consciousness with life we try to show how significant this concept is, how complex this concept is. In this context, we need to look at Searle's notion of consciousness. So, consciousness as a concept as Paul Johnston would uh, try to define referring to Wittgenstein um, in his book, The Rethinking the Inner. Johnston writes that to understand the concept of consciousness, we do not need to define or to describe it but to recognize what is involved in saying that someone is conscious. What is important is not a description, 
but understanding of the significant of the concept. So, we need to really talk about what is the significance of this concept, how it is explaining the various forms of life that human beings share when he or she encounter with uh, the other living beings in the world or other cases in the world or other immaterial bodies in the world. So, that is something very important. So, consciousness is to be talked and it is to be talked vis a vis its relationship with the other. We need to describe and recognize the meaningful aspect of conscious life. So, then we will be probably able to describe what is consciousness, consciousness as a concept and how it has been understood in our everyday life situations. So, sir tries to define consciousness in this way. Look at what Searle talks about when he says that consciousness is related to space and time or consciousness is related to the reality, because referring to Kant, he begins this chapter on structure of consciousness. Referring to Kant, he says that experience of objects are temporarily extended. So, when we talk about experience, when you talk about the representations of the world, they are represented in our thoughts or in, in our mental states and for some mental states are intentional states. They are also known as representational states. Now, these representational states have a structure in the sense that they involve the semantic content. So, when I express a particular representational state, I express with a content. This expression shows how my mental states are directed towards the world. So, when I think about my mental states or when anyone thinks for that matter, mental states are nothing but thoughts. So, when we are thinking, we are trying to relate ourselves with thoughts and thoughts are not material objects, thoughts do not exist in the world, thoughts are certainly mental their mental phenomena and if we talk about mental phenomena, then we refer to the interiority of our experience. It is not something available there, it is something available here with me. Maybe in Searle's language, Searle will talk about that something there in our head and that is the inner, not necessarily, you now this idea of inner is not something observable according to Searle, meaning thereby we do not really observe what is my feeling, what kind of happiness I have. So, that is a subjective one. So, subjectivity is a feature associated with consciousness or how do I look at a particular object in the world. So, seeing something as something, now this kind of ideas one can find in Wittgenstein and Kant. So, Kant when he talks about concepts or thoughts, Kant very much associates time with thought, because it is not available in space, it is, but we can always talk about uh, thoughts or the change of thoughts or change of mental states with reference to time. So, the mental states are extended in time, they are part of the inner world, not in Cartesian sense of course, but as I said that there is something which is existing in our head and that is what is mental. So, this very notion of the mental will be discussed once we talk about the, the dozen of features that Searle uh, explains as the property that composes the mental. We will talk about that, but what is important here again in Kant or again with the Cartesians that they believe in stream of consciousness. 
So, there is a, a continuity in consciousness. Consciousness is not a discrete phenomenon. Consciousness shows that it is always in a process. So, in that sense consciousness is flowing. When I say that we are all thinking being, thinking refers to a process, a mental process and that tells us how we talk about stream of consciousness. So, this phenomenological notion of consciousness that which is related with the time what is called phenomenological time does not exactly match with the real time. So, I can think of future, I can think of my past, I can live with my past, I can go back to what I did yesterday or day for yesterday or two years back or three years back things like that. I can always live in the present, I can always live in the past, I can also imagine my future. So, every conscious being has this potentiality to talk about future, to think about future and in that context Searle is referring to this idea of the phenomenological time which does not really resemble the real notion of time which we have that I got up at 6 o'clock, had my breakfast, came for this lecture etcetera etcetera. So, all these are happening in a real time framework which we all have in our everyday life, but what is phenomenological notion of time is the concept of time which is given to my consciousness. So, in my consciousness I go back to my past, I can live in my past in the sense that I experience my past. So, in my consciousness I can always imagine of a better future. Now, having a big bungalow, having a big car and so on and so forth. So, this idea of living in time is something very important when we talk about Kant, because Kant talks about the change of mental states or thoughts with reference to time, for it is the change of any physical object can be explained with reference to both space and time. So, far as temporality is concerned, the concept of time is concerned, it is only with reference to thoughts Kant is talking about or Kant can we can always talk about the concept of change in thoughts. So, this probably Searle is not interested here to bring in. So, what is Searle interested in? Searle is interested in the notion of consciousness and how it is being composed by various other features. Now, once that is told to us, we will try to see whether this notion of consciousness that Searle is advocating is analogous to the Cartesian notion of consciousness or not. That we one can very well reflect and try to bring some kind of a juxtaposition with reference to Descartes or and with reference to Dennett or the other functionalist. Because functionalist notion of the mental or consciousness is not a compositional notion of consciousness. Consciousness is not a compositional fact of different features and which are intrinsically associated with each other. Functionalist would deny this fact that consciousness is something irreducible, it is irreducible to the brain functions. Now, Searle also talks about the notion of other mind. It is not that I am thinking and I only think and others are not, but consciousness is something very social. I find that kind of naturalism Searle is bringing. Consciousness is not something Cartesian not something which is available to me alone, that is something very much. So, I will not advocate that, that consciousness is something very personal and it is not accessible to the other or this quote unquote personal will not constitute 
something called a collective. So, consciousness is is something very different, because consciousness is associated with intentionality and it is the feature of, of the intentionality that it would always associate itself with the other. It is a binding feature in the sense that it binds the other with itself, it binds the world with itself. So, this binding principle or the unifying principle that Sarl is talking about is something very significant, which would suggest that it is not me who is thinking, but it is the other which constitutes my being. It is the other which suggests that I am a person. I am a person identified with relation to something else. I am a person with reference to the other. When others leave, they give this identity to me that I am so and so with reference to a particular community or with reference to they. I am a father because I have a family and in my family my children have given me this identity that I am a father of so and so. Now, this very notion of a personal identity or me as a social being is grounded in social intentionality according to Sal. So, this idea of a social intentionality or collective intentionality that Sarl is speaking in his later works is something very significant. So, let us see what he talks about the other mind, the category of other people. So, other people are also important, the capacity of assigning a special status to other locus of consciousness. So, they have this capacity in the sense that they give me a kind of a social status. So, in their intentionality, my consciousness is located in a spatio temporal world, in a socio biological world. So, that is how I am associated with other and others are associated with me. So, consciousness has a biological background and it has also a social background. In a social background, I am identified as a person. Now, let us go back to the basic idea that how consciousness is composed in Searle's theoretical framework of biological naturalism. Now, Searle talks about a dozen of features, they are finite modalities, unity, intentionality, aspectuality or subjectivity. I mean for him subjectivity will be part of this notion called aspectuality and then Salta also talks about a conceptual connection, connection between what is conscious and what is unconscious. Then Sal also talks about Gestalt's psychology. Whenever we perceive something, we perceive at the background of certain things. So, human beings perceptions are always in the mode of a figure and figure is posed against a particular background. That is what is he means by the Gestalt's uh, psychology, he tries to bring Gestalt psychology into you know, this uh, idea that consciousness always or experiences are always against a particular kind of a background. Now, the other features are familiarity conditions, overflow, center and periphery distinction, boundary conditions, mood, pleasure and unpleasure. So, these are the dozen of features that Sal talks about in order to discuss the structure of consciousness. You can say that the manifestation of consciousness as a biological phenomenon will have all these features. Now, let us begin with this first notion called finite modalities. 
Now, what does Sal mean by finite modalities? Sal writes that human consciousness is manifested in strictly limited number of modalities. In addition to five senses of sight, touch, smell, taste and hearing, the sixth sense of balance, there are bodily sensation and stream of thought. Finite modalities are the modalities which talks about or which shows that how do we have sense experiences. Now, our sense experiences are finite. When I see all of you are looking at me, I have the experience of students looking at me. Now, this very experience is confined to a particular classroom, a particular classroom experience. You can call it a perception, you can also bring the other sense experiences that I am hearing your questions, I am looking at your faces, all this. So, all these are part of my experience and these experiences are finite. Searle does not believe in infinite experiences. Say for example, this experience of infinity in the sense that, that I am experiencing Brahman. Say for example, Brahman as you all know in Indian context is identified with a universal consciousness. So, this kind of conscious experiences are not discussed in the framework of the modalities that Sal talks about. Whenever Sal talks about consciousness, it is about our limited notion of consciousness that whenever I am doing something, I am conscious of that. So, the very fact that I am lecturing to all of you is giving me this impression that I am conscious of this very fact that I am lecturing. So, this Sal would call a kind of a expression of the finite consciousness. So, human consciousness are expressed in a finite mode, not in an infinite mode. The, the way it has been discussed by the spiritual seekers that consciousness is infinite and it is universal and it has a universal mode of representation. So, that kind of ideas Searle will not entertain in the framework of biological naturalism. Rather, Searle will try to locate how do we have sense experiences. He would also talk about the sixth sense, the sense of balancing. Okay. Suppose, I am very angry at you, angry at your questions. Now, this expression of anger are not supposed to be expressed when somebody asks a particular question. I must be reasonably accepting a question when it is thrown to me with a balanced mind. So, this idea of a balancing talks about a rational mind, mind which has a rational capacities. So, whenever I talk about actions or the manifestation of actions or the performance of a voluntary action, that represents a balanced mind. Now, this balanced mind or the expression of the balanced mind is certainly an expression of the finite mode of consciousness. So, that is how Sal will talk about different modalities, finite modalities in which we experience things in the world or we experience the reality etcetera. Let us go to the other concept that is the notion of unity. Now, unity is construed as one of the features of consciousness that consciousness or conscious mental states are unified. I have already talked about in my previous classes that all intentional states constitutes a network. So, there is a network of uh, intentional states, there is a network of intentional states. This network 
are connected. And when you talk about experience as a part of this network, because the network represents mind, the network as a whole represents the mind. So, if that is the mind, then it is interacting with the world, then the experiential features or the experiential connective shows that there are two modes in which we try to connect, we try to unify these experiences or you try to unify these thoughts or intentional states or representational states. According to Searle, there are two notions of unity, one is the horizontal notion of unity and another is the vertical notion of unity. The vertical notion of unity as Searle says, say for example, I have a tooth hack and I also experience the vase. I also experience the fragrance, fragrance of a toothpaste. I am also experience this fact that I am sitting on a sofa and brushing my teeth, very typical. I am suffering from toothache, I am experiencing the vase which is kept near the table and the, I also smell the fragrance of my uh, toothpaste. These are all coming to me kind of an unified notion of experience and Sal will call that now this kind of vertical unity. There is also some kind of unity which he says it is a kind of a horizontal unity. Now, what is this idea of a horizontal unity? Now, horizontal unity talks about the unity between thought and actions what I am thinking and what I am doing. That is connected with a reference to content. As I said, there is a semantic content involved. So, whenever a thought is expressed, it is expressed with the content and that content is identical with the action which is performed the act which is I am performing. They are not two separate things. So, Kant's notion of a transcendental unity of a perception is something very close to Searle's notion of a horizontal unity. When Kant says that space and time are to a priori say phenomena or concepts they are not certainly categories, they are every concepts and when I have a particular experience of something, I not only apply the categories, but also locate this experience as a part of the space and time and that gives or engenders some kind of judgment. So, a judgment is produced with the application of space and time as an a priori concept. So, space and time are the form of experience according to Kant. They are the form of experience. So, similarly, in Searle, we need to talk about consciousness as a kind of a binding principles, as a kind of a unifying principles. Now, this binding principle is also analyzed, is also analyzed from the point of view of neuroscience. The neuroscience talks about you know, the, the binding problem, how one neuron is connected with the other and so on and so forth. This connection is a causal connection. If x is a neuron and x is connected to C fiber, which is another neuron. So, whenever I have this experience of pain, the C fiber is simulated and therefore, it is simulating the x or it is connected with the x 
which is another neuron. Now, this kind of causal connectivity or neural connectivity also talks about the unity, the unity in the brain processes or what we call the binding processes. The connectivist model will talk about it in a different way and I am sure in your future classes, Professor Nath will be talking about the connectionist model of mind and the other representationalist like Fodder would also talk about how the representational states in an artificial systems are connected with each other. This overall gives an idea that each mental state is causally connected with the other, but in Searle the notion of unity that he is talking about is not causally connected. Rather, Searle will talk about intentionality. Searle says mental states are in principle intentional. Now, when they are intentional, they might be having some kind of a intentional relationship and that he defines with reference to mental causation. I have discussed about it in the previous class that when I act, I act with an intention. So, the manifestation of, an, of my intention shows that I am intentionally engaged with the other or the with the world and this intentional engagement is not purely causal. At the same time, I am also causally related with nature, because I am a physical being, a biological being and Sal gives this example that the gravitational force is operating. Whenever I am acting, say for example, when I write here, it is also this fact that there is a gravitational force which is operating. So, I am causally somehow connected with nature at the same time I am able to perform intentional action. So, it is this intentionality according to Searle is an essential feature of consciousness. Look at what Searle says for a large number of cases the consciousness is indeed a consciousness of something and the of quote unquote in consciousness of is of of intentionality. Now, this of talks about two things one is the expression of the psychological mode and another is the direction of feet. Now, the expression of the psychological mode we will talk about the condition of condition of satisfaction and I have discussed about it in the last class that whenever we talk about the performance of an intentional action we also expect certain things. So, when the expectation is fulfilled then satisfaction is generated. So, the fulfillment condition and the prior intention in which the action is performed are two different things, things which are intentionally connected with the network. So, therefore, to talk about that they are intentionally connected, Searle brings this idea of intention in action. I think I have also discussed about it in the last class that it is Sal talks about intention in action. It is this which shows the intentionality operating in experience that exhibit the intentionality operating in experience. So, suppose this is an agent A performing an action B 
when he performs he experiences it. So, for example, I am writing, I am experiencing this fact that I am writing and that is what he calls intention in action. What I intended to write and I wrote are two intentional states. If I could succeed in writing something, if I could succeed in telling something to you, then it gives me some kind of a pleasure, some kind of satisfaction. So, the, the generation of satisfaction is something which says that intentionality coming from the world and that is what is the direction of fit Sal talks about. So, there is a kind of a direction of fit. The direction of fit will talk about the connection between mind to the world or the agent who is a conscious being interacting with the world and the world also responding to this interaction. So, for example, if I request you to bring a glass of water and hearing my request you brought the glass of water, then I am satisfied because whatever I was expecting you did that. So, when you brought the glass of water for me, then it shows that intentionality is from the world to the agent or a world to the mind. So, intentionality thus talks about some kind of self referentiality which is involved in the expression of my prior intention. Because when I said bring me a glass of water, I also expected, I also desired that you would listen to me, you will listen to my request and offer me a glass of water. So, the very fact that you brought a glass of water was part of my desire, which is part of my prior intention. So, in, in that sense intentionality always having this feature called direction of fit, not only the psychological mode, but also the direction of fit. Sal also talks about two other features which are logically associated. One is aspectuality or prospectivity. Consciousness according to Searle is prospectival. Now, what is prospectivity or when you say that consciousness is prospectival, what does Searle mean by that? Now, according to Searle, my conscious experiences unlike the objects of experiences are always prospectival, they are always from a point of view. Now, this is very significant, they are always from a point of view. If I say that my students are most intelligent students of say 2010, now this I say it because I want to make a point to others that these students of my class SS 420 are the most intelligent students of IIT B from the base 2010. Now, if I say that I make a point that is my point of view. So, whenever a subject responds to the other or interacts with the other in the form of passing a judgment or making an assertion, then the, the subject or the person represents his or her point of view. So, it is the subject's point of view or the it is the first person's point of view, this is the case. It is from my point of view, I say that the students of SS 4 to 0 are the intelligent or the most intelligent students of the base 2010. Now, that is what is very significant. 
because that gives a perspective, a perspective which tells me that I compare these students with my previous batch student, I compare this with the other batch of students who are associated with me. So, this kind of comparison or analysis gives birth to my perspective that this page is a very good page. Now, the perspective and points of view are most obvious for vision, but of course, they are features of our sensory experiences as well. So, whenever we talk about experiences, the very fact that it is very clear according to Searle in the case of perception. So, when I have a visual experience of a particular object or a thing, then the perspectivity is very clear. I look at it from my point of view. Let us give an example of a rose is a flower and X is a poet. The poet looking at this beautiful rose, the poet suggests that the rose is beautiful. Look at a botanist. Now, when a botanist tries to look at the same rose, he looks at it from, from a perspective of biology, from a scientific perspective. That is the life condition of the rose. An ordinary human being who is also an lover is trying to look at rose from a different point of view with a sense of gift. Probably, he would offer it to his beloved. So, all this x, y, z poet, botanist and lover are looking at the same phenomenon, the same object from three different perspectives. So, in that sense consciousness is perspectival, because whenever we talk about a visual experience, we try to show that there is a perspectivality associated with this experience. So, according to Searle, it is very much clear in the case of visual experiences that consciousness is perspectival, but it could be associated with some other experiences when as I said when somebody is giving a kind of a judgment. I judge that x is right and y is wrong. So, right and wrong is judged from a particular perspective or when I appreciate so for example, a music, a piece of music my appreciation is always from a point of view. So, what Sal calls it a first person point of view. Now, spirituality is also associated with consciousness and it suggests that all intentionality or all intentional experiences are aspectual. So, for example, when I say C is object from a point of view is seeing it under certain aspects and not others. So, when I look at a rose, I look at it from a particular point of view, I also look at it an aspect of it, I do not see the entire, probably the entire is imagined and in my imagination I try to comprehend it. Similarly, a lover in his imagination tries to comprehend this fact that this he would offer to his beloved, but what is given to his experience is the only an aspect of it. So, what is given whenever we talk about an experience, what is given is only an aspect of it. So, the, the content of experience is constituted from this 
feature of aspectuality. So, and therefore, perspectival and aspectual are associated with the subject. They are part of the subject, they are part of the subjectivity of the agent's consciousness or the person's consciousness, because what it feels like me or what Thomas Nagel would say, what is it like to be a bat no, in his famous paper published in 1974 in philosophical review, Nagel suggests that the first person's perspective or the first person's representation of the reality cannot be ruled out. So, whatever may be their objective analysis, the analysis which is claimed by the scientist. So, for example, the kind of analysis which in the case of a botanist will be offering in the case of the lifespan of the rose. So, the scientific explanation would always gives us a kind of a third person perspective. So, the perspectivality which is associated with the scientific explanation of an experience is, is from a third person's point of view that which can be demonstrated, that which can be objectified, that which can be disclosed to others as they are is something always be the case in the case of the scientific explanation. But when we talk about philosophical explanation experience, we look at it from a first person point of view. So, consciousness in this uh, regard will have several other features which we would be discussing in our next class. So, today we could only finish some of the important features of consciousness that compose the network or the mind or that structures the intentional conscious states or experiences. They are the notion of modality, which is a finite modality, intentionality, unity and subjectivity, which is manifested in this features called perspectival and aspectual. So, with this I conclude my lecture today and we will begin uh, with the other features in the next class. Thank you.